Estamos en otra entrevista educativa. En esta ocasión tenemos la posibilidad de conversar con Robert Schwartz, director del Center for Teachings Thinking, que es un centro que existe hace 25 años en Estados Unidos. Eh, Robert Schwartz es un académico de la Universidad de Harvard inicialmente, en PhD, que después trabajó largos años también formando profesores. Y después creó su propio centro que hace 25 años se dedica a esta idea central del pensamiento, de cómo desarrollar un aprendizaje basado en el pensamiento. How are you, Robert? I'm fine, you know. And I'm actually, I want to say I'm delighted to be here. Okay. As I was in Chile a number of years ago and I really enjoyed working with teachers in schools and now I'm back, so I'm happy about it. Thank you. You were for a long time in this idea of of learning by with this focus in thinking. That's right. But what is the your diagnosis? What you are? Uh, why you begin this? We began this movement twenty okay. or thirty years ago. What is your intuition? Well, the, the as you know, teacher education. Okay, the education provided by universities to train teachers has been static for many years. It's, they've used the same methodology to teach teachers how to lecture to students, how to emphasize students memorizing things, and the kinds of tests that they need to give. And the, now, that has remained static, but the world has changed. And we're now in the 21st century, and there are, are many more demands and needs with regard to students who are going to be finishing school than there were earlier. Things were much more stable then. And, you know, there's a sort of factory model for learning. Now it's different. And yet the teachers are still trained the same old way. So now it's, you know, that's not enough. That's a perception of mine. But what really has moved us to try to help teachers is that they come to us and they say, the way we're teaching just doesn't really work anymore. They don't work, why? The, well, the, the answer of the students is not... No, they, well, I'll teachers. tell you, I mean, the, this is the picture we get, mm -hmm. okay? That they teach, they lecture, they teach students things that they, they think students need to learn. Students make notes. They read their textbooks, they make notes, then they give tests, and the students are tested and they have to give back the notes. So it's all, not all, but most of it is memory based. Mm -hmm. And the attitude of the students, the students know that the world is different and they don't have to really, nobody's going to ask them these questions ever again. So they go on to the next test and the next test and they forget, they leave behind the things they've learned to pass these tests. Now, that, it's sad because that means that even if the students are studying something really interesting and exciting, okay, it becomes only a means to what they think the goal is in their education, and that is passing these tests. So, you know, I've interviewed a lot of students about this, and. They all tell me the same thing. I say, why, I mean, why are you concentrating on these tests? I mean, why don't you, some of these, you know, studying, you know, wars and, and you know, the development of countries, I mean, that's interesting. They say, yes, it's interesting, but in school, that, it, that's going to get us, you know, learning certain things is going to get us a good grade on the tests. So that's why we do that. So I, I always ask, so, so what? I mean, what are the tests going to get you? And then they, tell, they often tell me something that is disturbing. And they say, well, I mean, the sooner we pass the tests, the sooner we get out of school and we go out into the real world. <laughs> okay. And, you know, so, it's I mean. It's a formal period that, that we need to surpass. <laughs> that's time. right. That's right. And, you know, you think, well, the teachers are saying it's not working, the students are saying it's not working, and there are better ways to do it, but the teachers don't know how to, what they are. 
So, I mean, I happen to have, in my career, I got involved with a number of people who were working on new ways of teaching, and teaching thinking was the basis. My field is philosophy, so this critical thinking is throughout philosophy, and it is just teaching thinking, but what we know is that students being good thinkers, being able to think through a decision and make a good choice, that's something that's important in their lives, not just in school. And if they're not learning how to do that well in school, then they're not going to do it well in their lives. And if they don't, they make mistakes, they get into trouble. You know, sometimes there are disasters that result when you make a wrong choice. And so there are a lot of reasons mm -hmm. why we think it's important to put teaching thinking skills, critical thinking, creative thinking, analytical skills, decision making f about actions that can be done. It's important to, to put those in the curriculum as skills that students need to learn to be able to manage in the world they're going out into. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, with that attitude, we have worked with a lot of teachers and we have developed through the teachers who have really tried to implement this in their classroom, we've developed some techniques that teachers can use that will actually shift things and will work with students. It's and interesting, that's, you, you know, have a sort of experimental form to develop that's your, right. your different right. methodology. This is the, the formula, this is years and years of practice, so you have a sort of main principles, a vision of the reality that is not okay for the students, for right. the teachers, and then you develop progressively That's right. this, this I mean, methodology. I have always felt that, I mean, I'm a university faculty member. The way I teach my students, I try to do these things in my courses, but these are university students. And you, I can't go and say, do this, this, and this to teachers of five-year-old kids. They have to do it differently. So what, what I've, you know, my style is to work with teachers and help them figure out how to implement this kind of teaching in their own classroom, in their own subject. And then when they really do a good job, they have good lessons, I will show those to other teachers and I'll say, this is what this teacher did, you know, in a science class. See if you can do the same thing in teaching history or teaching mathematics. And they, and they all want to do it. They want to try it out because the original was a great success. Okay. So I've accumulated over the years a big repertoire of good examples of teachers teaching this way. And real examples. Yes, they're real uh -huh. examples. And, and what I found is that it's that, you know, I mean, I could talk theory to teachers and I could tell them, well, this theory of learning is this and this and this, but that doesn't have any impact on their, te their teaching. The, that my feeling is if they, we get good lessons in which students are learning and we can really work on those and get them into their classrooms then they're doing great things. And then out of those examples, we can help teachers understand how come these students are doing a better job with this. Okay, and, and my view is that it stimulates a different kind of learning from just memorizing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, the, and that's been very exciting for me. I mean, frankly, more exciting than teaching my own university students. Mm -hmm. although I had to do that. And I tried, I mean, I always tell people that I've learned from some of the teachers I've worked with some things that I brought into my university classes from my own students. And they work. You know, so this has been a very rewarding process for me mm -hmm. as an individual. Um, but I, I mean, what really thrills me in all of this you know, I get older and older and older, and people say, you should really retire, you know, relax. You know, 25 years is a long time. Well, no, because my thrill is when I see students come alive, you know, when I see them, students who just sit around classrooms and do nothing, 
you know, they get challenged in, in, in TBL. Teachers, you know, ask them, you know, important questions and get them thinking. And they come up with ideas and other students come up with ideas. And there's a good sort of ferment and, and interaction. Well, that's exciting to me because the, the, the thing that gives me the most thrill, frankly, is that, of course. But when a teacher says to me, I never, ever thought my students could ever come up with any ideas like these. Okay. This is the maximum. That's <laughs> fantastic. And that means that this teacher has realized that these kids have in them many, many more capabilities and talents and they're going to lie dormant if you just ask them to memorize things, mm -hmm. okay? But that we can bring them out and we can, you know, and students will learn how to do these things themselves and with other people so that their lives will be enriched. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I, I love. <laughs> uh, a question that is important maybe is idea, what is your definition of critical thinking? Okay. All right, well, I, you know, I don't like to try to define things because you get caught up in that and somebody has a different definition. But the way a colleague of mine um, from the, the University of Illinois um, uh, characterizes critical thinking is something I like. He says that critical thinking is reasonable, reflective thinking, trying to decide what to believe and what to do, okay? And I mean, to me, the, what's behind that is, of course, that we, we want to believe things that are true. We don't want to believe things that are not true because we make mistakes that way. So how do we find out what's true? And the methodology of critical thinking is directed at helping students to do that, mm. okay? And reasonable reflective, well, what's that? Well, if you unpack that, that means students have to really they have to back up their ideas with evidence, with data, with good reasons. They can't just say, well, you know, the Russians are nasty people, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they're not, but you know, you, if, if you say, well, why do you think that? Then we're gonna be starting on the route to critically examining that idea, okay? Excellent. In in one of your books, you talk about this idea that the importance today for the for the this generation of kids and adolescents and teenagers to develop the skills to distinguish among the enormous yeah. uh, information that they receive, what is true or well, not true. I mean, that has troubled me for a long time because. You know, I think it's, it's a wonderful advance for students to have iPhones and, and tablets all the way down to little kids because they learn how to get thing, information that would have taken them weeks to find if they just had to go, go to libraries and places like that. So that's great. But the downside of that is that anybody can put anything they want on the internet and make it sound good. And unless you're discriminating, if you you know, if you're lazy and you enter something on Google, it gives you a list of links, and you pre press the first link there, and then you get information and you copy it down and you bring it into school. Well, you know that may not be good information. You have to be careful. So, what we stress is how to teach students to be able to make those judgments. Now, a teacher can do that. A teacher can say. Don't go to that website, don't go to this website, because they're, you know, it's misinformation. And that's okay, except that when the students are out in the world yeah, on sure. their own, and there's no teacher around, well, what do they do? So teach them how to do that themselves. And that's not too hard. You ask students, well, I mean, what can you find out about this piece of information that can help you decide whether it's reasonable? What can you find out about the source of the information? And they always come back with, well, who wrote it and what do they know about? Let's find out about them and where did it appear and is this a tabloid newspaper that it appeared in or a research book or, or whatever. So they know the right questions to ask and the teacher can help them figure out how to get answers and then they can make a judgment. 
Is this likely to be a good piece of information? Well, yes, it is. Okay, the author was a distinguished historian. He's not going to make any money by having us believe it. Okay, it was published in, you know, a book published by a publisher that's well respected, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, that's, that's sophisticated, but there are versions of that for little kids. Mm -hmm. You start them thinking about that question. Search evidence. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to ask, you get a piece of them, ask, is this something I should believe? And let me try to find out. And let me try to find out these things about where the information came from, etc. Um, Other skill thinking that you talk about this idea of uh, to how to take decisions. Yes. How to bring more elements That's for right. students. How is your approach of that? How? Well, that's easy because everybody makes decisions all the time. And what I suggest to teachers is that they start by asking kids to, you know, think about and describe a decision they've made that has been a good one, that worked. And they do, and they come back, and so that's a kind of positive start. And then describe one that you made that was not a good decision, okay? And let's try to figure out why it wasn't such a good decision. What might you have done that you didn't do that might have led to a different decision that you'd feel better about, okay? So that we throw it back to the kids, and what we found is that they know, I mean, they know what they need to find most of the time, and if not, the teacher can help them and add some things, okay? So they come up with a strategy. They say, well, you know, I shouldn't just decide because I like it. <coughs> I should think about what other possibilities are, what are the options, what are the competitors, and then try to find out information about each one. And what kind of information? Well, let's try to find out pros and cons, mm -hmm. okay? And then we can balance things, then we can compare them, and we can decide which one is the best one, given that information. But, connected with what we just talked about before, If the students are going to get information on the basis of which they decide this is a good thing to do, that information better be reliable and accurate. They better use that skill. That's why I think that's a tremendously important skill. If you start with misinformation and you can go through this whole process and say this is the best thing to do, you end up making a big mistake. Hmm. So, what do you think that you, you try to develop is the idea of, of metacognition. Yes. Do you think that, well, this may be, it seems a sort of very technical term, but you, you introduced that in your, in your practice. Too. That's right, that's right. Well, you know, metacognition is, is broad. It's as broad as thinking. There are lots of different ways of doing thinking and lots of, metacognition is thinking about your thinking, standing above it and thinking about it. But you can do that in a lot of different ways. And the, the trick is to try to help students learn how to think about what they've done as they went through a thinking process and ask, did it work? Can I do it better? Okay. So, I mean, we, we, there's a strategy that we use where the students describe what they did and then the next question is, did it work? Did you, get, did you achieve what you wanted? To achieve with it. And sometimes they say, yes, it's great. Sometimes they say, no, I had trouble with this and I'm not sure, you know. And then the teacher will say, well, how can you change it, fix it, so that when you do it, you feel more confident in using this technique? Well, to me, that's a great way to do something that human beings have been doing for thousands of years. Not about just thinking, but about things that they do. You know, you know, here I baked a chocolate cake. Whoa, hey, I put this in, did this and this and this, this. And now I've got the cake and let me take, oh, it tastes terrible. Well, what did I, I mean, I followed a recipe. What did I do? Mm -hmm. And did I do something wrong? And how can I change it to make it work better? Okay. You know, I, I remember, I, and you know, I'll never forget actually, being in a, a woodworking class in school where the students were learning how to use tools to build, make things out of wood. 
And the, I watched one student, and it was the first time he used a saw, and he used it the wrong way. And I'm, you know, I'm not supposed to interfere with these things. Okay, and the teacher noticed it. And the, so the teacher didn't say, you used it the wrong way. The teacher said, how did it work out? And he said, well, it didn't work out very well. You know, so the teacher said, well, what did you do? Well, I did this and this and this and this. Say, and what do you think? Was that, you know, did the things that you do really help you? Or were some of them hard to do? And this student said, well, you know, I got the piece of wood and I put it in the vise and I, you know, and, but I was having trouble with the saw. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so the teacher said, well, let's think about how you can avoid that. Okay, well, that's what metacognition is about your thinking. Okay. Excellent. You know. You, uh, one point that you, are, you, you argue about that, that this kind of uh, learning by thinking is not relegated to a sort of a new subject in the curriculum. No, you no. try to introduce all that's the right. transversal for all the contents. That's right. It's like reading and writing. You shouldn't have reading and writing as a separate subject because students learn, they use reading and writing, you know, in a lot of subjects. And a lot of schools have reading and writing across the curriculum. Okay, well, thinking, of course, is the same. Okay, and different, you know, different thinking strategies that work well in one subject can work well in another subject. And students discover it, teachers discover it. What I like in a school is when teachers are not just working on their own, but they're working with other teachers and they're coordinating how they're helping students to learn. And if thinking is a major part of that, that's great because then one teacher is not repeating what the other teacher did, et cetera. Um, no, but it's interesting in your case that because with your center you work in so different countries yeah. with so different curriculums, and in general, your evaluation is the problem is not in the curriculum. Right. That is in the contents of the curriculum. Right, right, right. But more in terms of the skill that they try to That's develop. Right. That's exactly right. And I, you know, I, as I've said, I worked in Saudi Arabia. That's an entirely different culture, different religion. The content of the curriculum is different. Okay. But what, what I've found, and it's not too difficult to figure this out without going there, is that if you have to make a decision in Saudi Arabia, it's a good idea to think about the consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's a kind of universal, you know, and it cuts across different religions, ethnic groups, et cetera. So I've come to feel that these, the, these thinking skills are really generic and they apply, you know, in the same way to a lot of different cultures and contexts. Um, and that, that, to me, that's very interesting. You know, it's not, you don't have to worry about the, you know, about, what, about, about the, the content of, mm -hmm. you know, what the students are learning and what they're bringing to it in the form of attitudes and, you know, religious beliefs, etc. But you have to help them to fit these strategies into those different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, yes, finally the thing is the thinking. That's it's right. Thinking. Well, thank you, Robert Schatz, for all this possibility to dialogue with you. And maybe the last question, that is the question about, well, you are advice for our country, for Chile. You oh, I got well, advice for Chile, be, boy, yes. What is your, your advice huh. for us in terms well, of how I mean, to improve our education? I think this country, I mean, there's enough interest in thinking and teaching thinking and how you can help students be better thinkers. And, you know, and enough people realize how important it is that the Ministry of Education should explicitly endorse that learning th thinking skills is up there at the top of priorities in the curriculum. Not to replace content, okay, but to, to be treated as key skills that students need to be able to learn in the best way they can learn. That's, and I think any Ministry of Education in any country needs to do that now. There's, there's enough 
data, there's enough research, enough experience to show that. Okay. So, thank you. Advice. <laughs> Good advice. Tuvimos la ocasión hoy día de conversar con Robert Schwartz de Estados Unidos, centrado en el aprendizaje en base al pensamiento. Y esta entrevista educativa, como muchas otras, está disponible en www.educarchile.cl. Los invitamos a seguir viéndolas.